and welcome to the latest in our Smart Pension Connect webinar series. I'm Darren Philp and I'm Director of Policy and Market Engagement here at Smart Pension. And in this webinar series, I interview guests from across the pensions and the fintech industries to discuss current trends and hot topics. And today's topic is Reflections from the Other Side, a former pensions minister sets out his take on key trends and developments in pensions. And I'm delighted to be joined by the Right Honourable Steve Webb. Hi Steve. Hello thanks, Darren. Thanks very much for joining us today. Great to have you here. So, so let's start at the top then. Um, what got you into politics? Well I started off as an academic, so straight from university I went to work for the Institute for Fiscal Studies, respected non-partisan think tank. And over the years, I, I mean, loved it there, it's been probably the best job I've ever done I should think. Um, but I got a bit frustrated because at one point I said to a colleague, okay, well, don't we have opinions? And he said, no, that's not our job. Our job is to analyze the data, put it out there and for others to decide. And I kind of got a bit impatient of, of being the, the analyst rather than the decision maker. Yeah. So after the 92 general election, which we'd assumed would trigger a change of government after 13 years of the Conservatives and didn't, I joined the Liberal Democrats in my case, got more involved in politics and then stood for the first time in, in 97. So it's really that feeling about wanting to be a player, not, not just a spectator. I think there's a crucial role for think tanks and analysts, but mm. personality wise, I wanted to be a doer as well. So you actually sort of wanted to, to sort of make a difference and, and, and be in the driving seat and you know, joining the Lib Dem, did you ever think you'd be in the driving <laughs> you spotted seat? spotted the floor here <laughs> in this kind of plan, haven't you? <laughs> I mean, I'm someone who, I mean, perhaps everybody's the same, but certainly for me, kind of consistency of, of values is really, really important. Yeah. So I had come across all the political parties through the IFS, uh, probably more contact with the Lib Dems, ironically, because the smaller parties need the resource of think tanks yep. than, than the bigger yep. parties do. I'd like people, I'd, you know, I met, Ed Davey, now the leader, Alan Beath, people like that, David Laws. You know, I got on well with all these folk uh, and felt that that was my kind of ideological home. Mm. I, I knew what I wasn't, that was for sure. But um, mm. And um, ironically, I got connected with a cross-party commission on social justice that the late John Smith set up. There were people like Patricia Hewitt, David Miliband on that. Uh, and I kind of got drawn into the political world. And it was actually Patricia Hewitt who said to me, you know, you're thinking of standing, 1997 is a really good time for you to stand for your party, mm. different party, you know, because I was thinking, oh, I'll leave it a bit longer. She said, no, this is the time when the tide is right. And she was absolutely right, because mm. I stood in a seat where I had no realistic chance. I was 11,000 votes behind. I used to say that I was the MP for the badminton horse trials, the Beaufort Hunt and Chipping Sobbery, <laughs> you know, not natural Lib Dem territory. And, and much to my surprise, I got elected first time. Yeah, wow, well, congratulations on that. That was uh, amazing. And, um, you know, Big Lib Dem, yeah. Um, you know, you did lots of good work from the back benches, um, you know, in Parliament. And I remember when I was a sort of Treasury official, um, we always used to, you know, um, have, a, have a dose of fear when Steve Webb got interested in a topic <laughs> because of the sort of the intellectual um, sort of rigour with which you pursued things. Um, did you ever expect to become pensions minister? Because, you know, everyone, you, you, you were so passionate about pensions. You did so much work about pensions. And, you know, there, there was probably a, a feeling that you would, would you ever get to do that job? And then, you know, 2010 happened, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely not. And I mean, so, you know, to be honest, I didn't necessarily expect to ever be an MP. Mm. But, you know, you don't join the Lib Dems as a fast track to power on the whole. Um, so I had no expectation, really. So in a way, everything's been a gift. Everything's been a bonus. Mm. You know, you can't be too... I could be bitter and twisted about 2015, but for goodness sake, I had 18 years, five years as a minister and something yeah. I really care about. It's, you know, but no, I absolutely didn't foresee it. Yeah. Uh, and so it was all the more sweet really when it happened. Yeah, and that must have been, um, th th you know, that must have been a day of celebration when you um, found out that you were gonna sort of be the top board on pensions in the UK. Yes, and I mean, you know, uh, even with us having won, there was no guarantee I would be a minister. Mm. There were only so many slots in the coalition because mm. we were the, the smaller party. Um, the irony is that um, only two, I think, Conservative MPs lost their seat in 2010, and one of them was Nigel Waterson, mm. uh, who stayed in the pensions industry, but Nigel was the Conservative's pension spokesperson, yeah. and he lost to a Lib Dem, so I think it's probably doubly embittered, <laughs> or could, could be justified in being so, I don't know whether he is or not. Um, and so that meant there was kind of a hole, mm. a Steve Webb shaped hole. So rather than there being a Conservative who felt that was their job, mm. uh, there wasn't, at least in the House of Commons. So it, it was almost a bit easier. Yeah, no, excellent, excellent. And, um, you know, you, you mentioned you were Pensions Minister for five years. What do you think um, was your biggest achievement during that time? And can you choose one for a start? Well, favourite children, isn't it, really? Yeah. I mean, I think 
there are things that would have happened whoever had been in that post. So I think auto-enrolment would have happened, although I feel that we did a lot to make it succeed. Mm. So, you know, uh, we could talk a bit more about that, but certainly there were aspects of the original design that could have caused it to fail, I think. And I think we fixed them with the aid of outside uh, work. Because you groups. launched a review as one of the first things you did as minister, wasn't it? We did. And it's funny because the civil service were determined that auto-enrolment should happen. So I think they suggested we call it the making auto-enrolment work review, mm. not the shall we do auto-enrolment yeah, review. Yeah. Um, but just to give you one example, the original plan was as soon as you earned above what in today's money is about 6,000 or so a year, this kind of floor, you'd be auto-enrolled on the first pound. So you earn 6,001 for round numbers sake, 6,000 the floor, 6,001, you'd have been auto-enrolled on the pound. Mm. We came in at 1%. Mm. So there would have been employers in the land who were paying a penny, who'd had to set up a pension scheme to pay a penny a year mm. into a pension. We would have been laughed out of court. Yeah. So people are very critical of the 10,000 trigger for auto it's kind of received wisdom in the industry, this is terrible and bad for women and so on and so on, yeah. and it should go. But there's a reason for that. Yeah. And the reason is that when you're auto enrolled, there is at least a chunk of money going in. Yeah. And, and that's what the 10,000 did. So a lot of it was defensive to try and make auto enrollment mm. work. Uh, the three month waiting period at the start so that employers weren't kind of on day two, I was banging on the door, finding yeah. them for not, you know, all that sort of stuff, just to, just to make it land. So, so make an auto enrollment work review, but back to your favorite children question. So. Um, Yes, auto enrolled, of course, yeah. and will be of lasting benefit. Pension freedoms, you know, was, was treasury led, but they unusually involved me, which they didn't always, but on that occasion they did. And I'm a great believer in pension freedoms, notwithstanding the unfinished business. But it would have to be the new state pension, mm. because I think that wouldn't have happened without me. I really, really cared, as you know, about the state pension. I wanted to make it fairer for women, simpler, fairer for the low paid and so on. And for all its flaws and for all the constraints of the way in which we, we had to do it, to actually legislate for it and, you know, since then see the first new state pensions paid, it's yeah. been really thrilling. Well, that, that was, um, I, I, you know, if I was a betting person, I'm not, I would have said that was your, you know, you'd have said that was your top, top, top achievement as a minister. And, you know, when I was a, an APF, as it was at the time, we were great supporters of... Which was much appreciated. The, 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 we needed allies because the yeah. Treasury were instinctively suspicious of the DWP in general. Well, well I think, um, I remember, because when, when I joined, uh, we overlapped when I was at the Treasury. Of course. Yeah. Um, and... Um, I think um, we were at an event one time, and you and you sort of um, buttonholed me and said, well, "I need to talk to you about um, <laughs> the ideas for this new state pension." And I was like, "Oh no, you can't talk to me. You need to talk to ministers." But um, I think when I when I had resigned from the treasury and I was in the process of moving to the NAPF, I, I remember sort of meeting you in your office, and it was like having a conversation around. Um, so how do we get this with a the zealot? <laughs> <laughs> you know, which was which was great. But you know, I think it was it was almost the unfinished business from the Turner Commission. Yeah. Um, um, you know, they did lots of analysis around the state pension. They made lots of good changes, um, but there were some complexities that had to be worked through. Mm. And I think, you know, the the driving force behind that. And you know, we've got a, we've got a better state pension system, you know, as a result. Mm. So, you know, that's a that's an absolutely fantastic legacy to have. Um, so, on the flip side, though, yeah, um, you're obviously someone with lots of great ideas and you know, lots of ambition and all of that type of stuff. What is the one thing you wish you could have done as a minister, but you never got round to doing? Um, or you weren't allowed to do? Well, oh gosh, <laughs> that's a different list. I mean, so there's one thing we ran out of time on, or probably two really, and then one thing I think we just didn't get right, which was obviously the state pension age, mm. so the WASPy stuff and all mm. of that. And I think had I, it all happened very early on, you know, you know, hands up, we didn't get it right. It all happened very early on, and I wasn't probably as sharp as I should have been as to my ability to block stuff. Because, you know, I was very much, there's 300 Conservatives, there's 50 or so of us, by and large, they get most of what they want democratically. Mm. So when the Treasury were pressing for a faster increase in the state pension age, I should have said, no, no, the coalition agreement stops us doing anything till 2020, and dug my heels in, in the coalition agreement, but I, but I didn't. Uh, and that's probably something I should have done. Um, in terms of things that I would have liked to have seen through, I mean, pot follows member and all of that. So, you know. I'm the, sure we'll talk about that in a yeah, minute. Yeah, the, <laughs> the whole landscape's littered with small pots. We never really kind of got mm. around. You know, we legislated in 2014 for the principle, but we never implemented that. And then it would have been nice to see the defined ambition, risk pooling, mm. risk sharing stuff seen through. But in a way, although actually the 2015 Act that we passed got pretty much in, repealed in toto. Um, 
to do the Royal Mail stuff. Mm. At least, actually, I thought it'd be 10 years before we see any risk pooling. Mm. And in fact, within a few years, it's happening. So in a way, I kind of feel vaguely vindicated on yeah. that one. Well, you were certainly busy as a minister, weren't you? <laughs> and you had lots of, um, you know, lots of ideas and were driving lots of stuff forward. Um, so let's just think for a minute about your time now in transition from the being a minister and being in that position of power into the into the private sector. And obviously you've been at um, Royal London and now a, a partner at LCP. Um, quite often you get calls from the commentariat for a standing pensions commission. Um, you know, what is your view on that? Is that something that is needed? Yeah. Um, and has that view changed since you, you, you've sort of moved from you know, being the person in power to someone who's trying to influence stuff from the outside? Yeah. I, I'm still sceptical of the Standing Pensions Commission idea. I mean, I think I, I, I bow to nobody in my respect for the Turner Commission, you know. And I think Adair Turner was above all a political operator. Well, is, I'm sure. Uh, you know, I was really impressed by the way he built alliances and all of that kind of stuff. So you got the late, sadly, John Hill's brilliance. You have got Jeannie Drake's brilliance. You know, you got really good people, very, very small, interestingly. And I think that that was one of the keys. Mm -hmm. You know, when you've got fifteen people who've got to sign off on a committee, I think that's much yeah. harder. So I think it was, you know, a superb example. But I do just wonder if you could play the same game again. So mm -hmm. we already bring together the great and the good for on issues. You know, the department are always setting up, you know, Jamie Jenkins 2017 review, Chris Curry and others involved mm. in that. So, so the department does tap into specialists for specialist topics. But whether you really need a kind of standing, because, you know, the biggest unresolved issue in pensions for me is tax relief. And that's a really political subject, you know, rich and poor, DB and DC, public sector, private sector, this generation and the next generation. Could a group of boffins locked in a room like this for long enough come up with the answer? Yeah. They could probably help rationalise the process, but the, you know that's why we elect people. Mm. So you know. yeah, and I've I've got a similar view because like you, the pensions commission was a wonderful piece of um, work. It was um, you know the level of analysis, uh, mm. the level of stakeholder relations and engagement, and yeah. all of that type of stuff. It was a real sort of tour de force. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes what's missing is this sort of analytical. The, the, the evidence-based policy making. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Pension Commission did really, yeah. really well. Yeah. Um, and I think there's still a role, well, my personal view is there's still a role for something like that. And you get organizations like PPI who, who do some of that, but yeah. they're like the IFS, they don't really have a view. Um, but you know, can you ever take the politics out of pensions? Yeah. It's big money, it's yeah. tax decisions, it's spending decisions, it has distributional impacts regulatory agenda and all of that type of stuff. You know, if you don't have politicians making um, decisions on that, why do you have politicians yeah. in a way? So yeah, no, that's, um, that's, a, no, that's a really interesting perspective. And um, I know that the PPI are doing some work at the moment to develop a framework, mm. which again, you know, should help people understand the trade-offs when it comes to policy making, because there's always those trade-offs. And, and just, just on that, I, I think, you know, you get elected, you finally get to sit in that seat. It's quite an ass to then say, yeah, but these guys over here are going to decide what we do. It's yeah, going to, well, yeah, hey, yeah, you know, yeah. just cut out the middle, man. But thanks know. for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, imagine, um, I don't know, there was a by-election and you, you got, um, <laughs> you know, uh, parachuted into power and, you know, there was this vacancy for a pensions minister that had just come up. Yeah. Um, you, you know, what, what would your current priorities be as, 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 as a minister? Well, I would insist, first of all, that it was a joint Treasury and DWP appointment. Mm. I do think the fragmentation of pensions between the two departments is madness. And I know people in the pensions world are nervous of having the Treasury even more involved, but you just can't make rational policy if you know the tax side can just be changed. Yeah. And you know, there's plenty of evidence that there are times the tax sides get changed and the DWP get told on the day, kind of thing. Well, that's just madness, yeah. really. So I think that's the first thing I would do. Um, I think some of the current priorities are good. I mean, so I tried a bit on the kind of climate change sustainability stuff. Uh, and it just wasn't the right time. Perhaps I wasn't effective enough, I don't know, but it wasn't the right time. Mm. Uh, I think post-austerity, there was a big push on getting the economy going and so on. Uh, I, I respect the fact Guy Opperman's made climate change a big theme and you know, no doubt we'll see more regulation in that space. So I think that's, that's good. Um, but I think some of the kind of smaller obsessions, you know, the, the statement season and all this kind of stuff are just kind of a bit gimmicky and a distraction. So, you know, uh, you know, big fan of the dashboard, at least it's moving. Mm. Chris Curry's doing a great job, but it's a tough, tough ask. 
But, you know, that's got to be the direction of travel. The idea we all take, as I think the minister said quite recently, you know, we're going to be discussing this in the pub, mm. you no know, doubt with our sheaves of pension statements in our back pocket kind of thing. It's just for the birds. I'd rather do it on an app. <laughs> well, but if I was going to talk pensions, well, if anyone's going to talk pensions in a pub, it's probably us two. Let's, yeah. let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we're not, we're probably not representative of the uh, UK population. On well, this, no, and, and particularly if you're focusing on the working age population, it's one thing to say, oh, well, digital solutions are no good because pensioners are less likely to be online. Mm. I kind of get that. But this isn't really a pensioner thing. It's a working age yeah. thing. But overwhelmingly, these folk, we are living our lives online. Mm. And to devote regulatory, legislative time and attention to, you know, getting everyone to have a statement in a month, presumably they're supposed to what, put one on the mantelpiece until the next one comes and then sit down with a mug of coffee and study them together. And of course, if, if, if Nest send out their, I don't know, 9 million statements or whatever it is, uh, one week, presumably they get 900,000 calls to the call centre that week or whatever it's, you know, that's just, it's just ridiculous. So I think, I think there are distractions and absurdities. Um, but some of the big themes, I mean, I'd like them to get on with DB consolidators, mm. you know, make a decision for goodness sake, let's not have this interim framework and everything in limbo, you know, either it's the right thing or it isn't, but we can't have this kind of TPR sort of things it might be, but we'd rather central government made a decision. Yeah. So that, that would be good to progress. In. You made a really interesting point about the dynamic between DWP and the Treasury, um, but we're in the context of pensions. Do you think you could sort of extend that to sort of look at pensions and saving and sort of financial resilience and financial inclusion altogether? Um, because, you know, I, I always thought that, you know, you never had the sort of the pensions and the widey savings agenda sort of joined up from a government perspective? Yeah, I certainly think pensions and savings, I would agree. So, you know, as a pensions person, I am always, oh, you've got a spare pound stick it in your pension. But of course, I in my spare time, I do a small amount of debt advice. So I trained as a debt advisor. And of course, what you realise is that people don't have short term savings, mm. you know, so the car breaks down, whatever it is, you need 500 quid. You haven't got it, you go to a high cost lender, you get a spiral of debt. Mm. So actually, I think we in the pensions world, I don't know, sidecar savings and all that kind of stuff, but probably have neglected the short term savings aspect. And I think controversially, we have to think about young people and housing. Mm. Because of course, for my kids who are in their 20s, a good outcome in retirement for their standard of living is not having rent to pay. Mm. Yeah. So it's not, it's not you invest in housing as a commodity, as an asset class. It's you try and get on the housing ladder so that you're clear of debt by the time you retire and then you don't need as much pension. Yeah. So in many ways, helping my kids, you know, I could put money into a pension for them, but if I put money into a house deposit for them, I'd probably help their retirement prospects more. Mm. Yeah. And that's a controversial sort of thing to well, say. But, it's, it's a holistic know. view. Yeah. You know, what it is, it's, it's not just about pensions. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> I think, you know, one of the... How dare you? <laughs> yeah, yeah no, exactly. Um, yeah. And one of the problems with the Pensions Commission was it was just a Pensions Commission. Yeah. And it didn't sort of always sort of go beyond pensions. Um, but I think, you know, certainly from a pensions industry perspective, I think there's a lot more debate and discussion now around a more holistic approach other than you know, if you're going to go back 10 years, it was like pensions is sacred. Yeah. You know, pensions is the number one, one priority. Um, have, how have your views changed? Have they changed um, <laughs> since being a politician? And, you know, given that you've got the experience from the private sector now, you know, Royal London, as we said, and, and, and LCP, you know, what, what, if you had, if you have your time again, what sort of knowledge or experience yeah. from from that would you sort of take back in terms of your thinking as a minister? I think the biggest single thing would be the the issue of change, imposed change, and the costs to providers of doing that, and the lead times. So, um, you know. I still remember, I mean, actually, as a minister, I, I responded to this because we were still dithering about the charge cap. And as it got to December, and we were planning to do it the following April, and someone said to me at a conference, you know, look, it's only about 12 weeks away. We need to know, mm. make your mind, you know, you can't just do this at short, we have to plan, etc. And, and we actually delayed it a year mm. off the back of that comment at a conference. Mm. Right. Because I listened and I thought, you know, you're right, actually, mm. we can't treat people like this. And I got terrible flack for delaying it for a year, and Polly Toynbee wrote in The Guardian, it'll never happen. 
and how right she was. Oh no, she was wrong. <laughs> Fancy that. Um, but you know, uh, so I think I think you know, working at Royal London, a big kind of operation, you know, seven hundred thousand members or whatever it was at the time in workplace pensions and so on, that actually just system changes and the fact that there's a set of stuff you absolutely have to do to deal with regulations and so just the capacity to do these things. I don't think ministers really understand. And likewise on the dashboard, for example, mm. so LCP now advises a lot of DB schemes and you've got a spectrum where obviously some have got tip top data and some haven't. Um, and, you know, the idea that you can just demand that data be provided and pretend, I think DWP are pretending. I heard Guy up on the other day say something like this is just the paper statement online. Well, it ain't. Yeah. You know, especially not for DB. Not for DB, yeah. particularly as I'm a deferred member of the parliamentary scheme. I haven't heard from them for mm. years. Mm. I've no idea what my current pension revalued from when I left mm. six years ago would be. So what number is it I'm going to get on the dashboard? Well, the number from six years ago is the only one I've got on a piece of paper. It ain't that. Mm. I could ask for the one now, which is what DWP is sort of saying. It's the number you could ask for. But actually, it's not going to be that. It's going to be some sort of projection yep. estimated retirement income, which I have no access to at the moment. So I think DDPV needs to come clean on what it's asking of the industry and be realistic about timetables. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good point. And, um, you know, having worked at the Treasury and then an APF um, and doing the sort of more public policy type roles, that was probably one of my biggest learnings as well. Like stuff does take time. And I always used to think at the Treasury, like, it's a bit, the industry's just using Special it pleading, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, you can cry wolf too many times on this stuff, but it is genuine. And, and also there's an opportunity cost to this stuff as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Because, you know, people want uh, pension providers, insurance companies to be more innovative, but they'll have a change budget or, or a change, a certain amount of change that they could do in any one particular year. Yeah. And if that is all used up through legislative change and stuff that they have to do to be compliant, yeah. then where's the scope for innovation? And yeah. where's the scope for sort of testing stuff and, you know, really sort of progressing the proposition? So is that trade, there is that trade-off within that as well? There is, and I think there's something that happened recently which DWP ought to learn some lessons from, which is in terms of processing new state pension claims, which is they got really behind. Mm. Over the summer, people were waiting months for their pension. So you wait a month anyway, but beyond that, you know, months, we had pensioners going to food banks. It was just awful. And what had happened was partly demand had increased, but partly they diverted some people off to another important task, uh, in state pensions. And, and of course, the same people can't do both jobs. So of course, if you divert people off the main job and demand's going up, you've, you've got a problem. Well, if that's what happened in their department, why wouldn't it be the same in the pensions industry? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. So we've talked a bit about, um, you know, your experience as a minister and stuff, but, you know, we, we, we need to sort of discuss some of the current big issues within pensions and, and, and the like. And uh, let's, let's start with consolidation. Um, you know, there's been a real drive for consolidation um, and, you know, for various reasons, value for money, um, productive finance, investments and all that type of stuff. Um, is, is the government right to have consolidation as an agenda? And do you think that the pace and the, 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 the pace of change is right? And are they doing it for the right reasons? <laughs> um, I, I think a sophisticated consolidation agenda is probably a good thing. Yeah. There's a risk it just becomes a panacea. You know, you just wave the consolidation card yeah. again kind yeah. of thing. So, and obviously there's DB and DC. So, I mean, on DB, there is no doubt there is a long tail of small DB schemes where the government standards are just not good enough. Now, it might be that consolidation is the answer. It could be a DB master trust, not necessarily a super fund, mm. you know, there's variations. Mm. You could put a professional trustee in, you know. So there are variations. It's not one size fits all, mm. I think. But clearly something must be done for governance reasons. Um, on DC, I think there is a risk of undervaluing the single employer trust. Not that it's always right, but you know, you do know that employers are more committed to a trust in their name, where they're almost certainly meeting some of the costs, yep. where perhaps if <clears> it went into a master trust, uh, they wouldn't. So, you know, the swings and roundabouts here, uh, and I think it probably is case by case rather than just trying to bludgeon. Yeah. smaller schemes into a into a into a, a larger entity um and yes of course bigger schemes can probably run cheap i don't know if there is a, a too big i'm not sure mm. we're there yet but mm. you know there could be a too big perhaps um 
But you know, other things being equal, they ought to be able to invest in a more diversified way and, and all of that kind of thing. So I think in principle, the presumption that bigger is better is, is a reasonable starting place, mm. but you've got to challenge it in the individual case. Yeah, I think that's right, because there's no reason that a single employer trust can't give really good outcomes, you know, especially if the employer is paying all the charges, yeah. that it's, you know, it's giving the trustees a, a good governance budget, a good investment budget, and you can, you know, but you have to do it properly. Yeah. And I think the, the, the scale thing sometimes is a proxy as to whether the employer is doing it properly or not. Mm -hmm. um, so now I, I, I welcome, your, welcome your comments on that. Um, closely related to this, yeah, is the whole sort of um, productive finance debate and um, you know, what pension scheme should be investing in and, and, and all of that type of stuff. Um, you know, is this the right debate to be having and should government be being getting involved in that? And what, what are your views on you know, proposals to change the charge cap, for example, to, to you know, facilitate more um, pension scheme investment in the liquid assets? Well, you can certainly see why if you were the government and broke, mm. you'd want to try and deliver your objectives using somebody else's money. I mean, it's pretty attractive. You don't have to tax people, you, you know, you just say to you know, these pension funds sitting on trillions of pounds, literally, uh, you know, spend a bit more on bridges in the north of England or whatever it is we think, broadband or something like that. Um, so you can, you can see the attraction. And provided that generates a good return to the scheme, then, then, mm. then why not? But that raises the question why schemes aren't doing it in any case. And I think, for example, on, in the DB world, we hear of schemes who have been told by the regulator to head towards buyout who in five years' time are going to be handing everything over to an insurance company. And of course, the insurance companies say, we don't want a bridge in the north of England. Mm. We can't do anything with that. It doesn't fit our asset profile that we want. So actually, that's one concrete example um, of why you need to look underneath the bonnet as to why these things aren't happening. Yeah. I think on the specific issue of the DC charge cap, it just feels like a complete red herring to me. So. It's the default fund for workplace pensions. So the chooser is the employer. Yep. So I'm an employer. I can go to a big DC master trust charging me 30, 40 basis points, whatever it is. Or somebody else is going to come along, a niche master trust, who will charge me 100 basis points, but invest in something whizzy with performance fees and good returns. Which one am I going to pick? Mm. You know. Yeah. So it could be that even if they relax the charge cap, it's never used. Yeah. Um, and you know better than me, I'm sure, what the barriers are to, to, you know, not just cost, but, you know, the opacity of some of these investments. Yep, the governance around it, the structure all of the investments, all, all of, that. of that type of stuff. You know, yeah. So let's talk, now I like the, the LTAF framework, the FCA's long-term asset framework. I can think that's a step forward mm. if that enables more liquidity, for example, you know, uh, but just asserting that it will be so doesn't make it so. But I, th I feel like the FCA are trying to solve the problem, yep. whereas the budget announcement was a bit tokenistic, I think. Yeah, and no, I think um, I think that's um, fair play, and um, you know, look, being an auto enrolment scheme, um, a smart pension, um, you know, you're you're 100 percent right in the sense of it's a competitive market out there, you know, and it's a market that probably is too much driven by price, um, and I'd be surprised if uh, any of the schemes at the moment, it's the charge cap that is the biting yeah. constraint on this. Yeah. Actually, it's the fact of you know what employers um, actually want to buy and purchase on behalf of their members. And it's what consultants are, are driving as well. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, yeah, like just, just, just wishing pension funds spent more on this stuff isn't, isn't the answer. Um, for me, it's about sort of breaking down some of the barriers. Yeah. Um, but that sort of then goes into sort of the structure of the products. Um, so it's more supply side interventions that are needed than demand side, but that's probably a whole different, um, different webinar. <laughs> um, Tax relief. <laughs> we, we have to talk about tax relief. Um, you know, every, before every fiscal event, um, there's the will the chancellor, won't the chancellor, you know, um, do another raid on pensions, let's mm. call it that. Um, you know, and the current system dodged a bullet at the last budget. Again. Uh, again, <laughs> yeah. Um, two questions. Is there a case for reform? Yeah. And um, if there is, do you think that reform will ever happen? <laughs> I mean, it's funny, every time you look at it, you think what an awful system we have, and then you look at any incremental change and it's probably worse, you know. So, and that's, that's actually really what's happened with policy. Every time the Treasury has looked at this practically, you know, twice a year, I would imagine for the last 40 years or something, they've ended up saying, 
do you know what? We can just have half a billion by shaving something. Why would we bother upsetting, you know, yeah. huge numbers of gainers and losers? So, so a bit of me would like to sit down, and I probably this might be a sitting down in a darkened room one, at least at first, to just sort of set out some principles, the data, what you're trying to achieve, mm. maybe. Mm. Ultimately, it's a political call. But even if a, perhaps the Commission of the Great and the Good give you a menu with options and the politicians choose, perhaps, I, I, I don't know. Ultimately, it is a hugely political call. Yeah. Um, but I suppose there are, there are corners that I really don't like. I mean, the money purchase annual allowance mm. is an obvious one. Nobody knows what it is. I do a weekly column for This Is Money. Readers write in. And every time I do a column on this, I get lots of people writing and saying, oh, what about, oh, I've taken some money from my DB. Does that count? Or just took the tax-free cash. Is that all right? You know, all this stuff. And the idea that you penalise someone who's tapped into a bit of taxable cash who then wants to save, for goodness sake. Mm. I mean, what? You know, you can have recycling rules, and we've got them yeah. anyway. So, yeah. so, so there's a lot of niggling. You know, the tapered annual allowance and the doctors and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So there are there are things that could improve it incrementally. I personally, do you know what I would be tempted to do? This is purely personal view, not that of Lane Clark and Peacock. LLP, um, <laughs> I'd be tempted to have a DB regime and a DC regime and be done with it. Mm. I'd make the DC regime relief at source. So everybody pays into a pension out of their take-home pay, and then HMRC tops it up. And immediately, you could do something about higher rate relief, basic rate relief, and all that mm. stuff. You wouldn't need this nonsense of 53 quid in three years' time mm. and all that. Mm. You wouldn't need all that. And you could then really, t if DC is the future, you could really tier public support for pensions to the people who need it most. So you could say, first thousand quid you put in a pension, we'll double. Not 30% flat mm. rate relief or something. We're going to double it. And then the next thousand will add fifty percent, or or something. Now, all right, immediately yeah. it gets complicated. Yeah. But, but the, so so having a ring fence DC world, if DC is the future, sort of appeals. And then and then you can really channel the public money to where it's needed most. You have a DB world that probably has either an annual or lifetime allowance, probably a lifetime allowance, I suspect, mm -hmm. that gets over the doctor's problem. Now, of course, there's a poor boundary between these two, and that's mm -hmm. always been the problem. And maybe you have some sort of backstop, messy stuff, you know, mm. for people who really insist on moving shed loads of money from one side to the other of the line or whatever, you know. So, so I can't say you'd get rid of all complexity, but I do think for the bulk of people, it could be a lot simpler and a lot more effective. So maybe that's a less worse solution than the yeah. one we've got. So I, 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 I sort of think along similar lines at times that, you know, we, 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 we had the A-Day uh, reforms back in um, 2004, 2006, and that, that whole agenda was pension simplification, an oxymoron if there ever <laughs> was one. Um, but, but, you know, that worked when actually the lifetime allowance and the uh, um, annual allowance didn't bite yeah. for the vast majority yeah. of people. It's yeah. when the Treasury was flush with cash, I mm -hmm. can imagine. Um, so I think, you know, and, and, and the beauty of that regime was to, if there was one, was to combine all of the sort of six or seven regimes that there was before, treat DB and DB the same. That's why it was simplification. But as soon as you start trying to work it through, you just add complexity and, and, that's, and that's what we've seen. How, how, would you, how would you ensure sort of broad equivalence between DB and DC in, in, in your sort of solution there? Because I think that's the thing that worries me if you treat DB and DC differently. Yeah. Um, because DB pen pensions, you know, are a lot more generous than DC pensions. They don't yeah. have to be, but yeah. they are. Yeah, because obviously you're getting the increased contributions or typically higher contributions in the vast majority of cases, but also you're getting a guarantee. Yeah. So how would you sort of make that sort of fairness between the two? In a way... Or do you, don't you think it's necessary? In a way, it's simpler because DB is more or less synonymous with public sector. You know, if we assume private sector DB will continue mm. to decline over time, then what you're really saying is, what's the pension regime for public sector workers? And that's part of their overall remuneration package. Uh, and frankly, their pay has been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. So, you know, you can debate whether public sector workers are over or under paid slash mm. paid plus pension. Mm. But you almost say, what's our policy for people who work in the public services? So you don't make it a pensions issue. You make it an overall remuneration issue. And then you set your parameters of the system so that, you know, nurses get fair remuneration overall, yeah. including pensions. Um, and, you know, again, for the bulk of people, you know, if you're an average nurse, the lifetime allowance isn't an issue, the annual allowance isn't an issue. And I sometimes think we're driven by the extremes. Mm. You know, the mm. debate is all about the yeah. people who read the Sunday Times money section and the people who 
you know, write it. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So, so maybe you could effectively ring fence public sector, have a regime that's sensible and fair for their overall remuneration and not worry too much. And actually then on the private sector side, you as a society decide how much you want to spend topping up the pensions of the low paid so they retire with a decent standard of living. And you can shovel some of that back from people like me, mm. you know. Yeah. So we've talked a bit about auto enrolment and your role in um, delivering, you know, probably one of the greatest social interventions that we've ever had. Um, you know, well, certainly in pensions, I would argue. Um, and, and we've also sort of touched on statement season and the like as well. Um, what do you think the right balance is between harnessing inertia and using techniques like auto enrolment versus, um, you know, better engagement and getting people to take personal ownership of their pensions? Yeah. I suppose in a world where you can't touch your pension till you're 55, soon to be 57 ish. Um, Actually, I'm pretty relaxed if people in their 20s and 30s are just nudged in the right direction and left alone. I'm just not really terribly worried mm. if, if we get the right contribution rates and all the rest of it. Um, and actually, we probably support them more in the things we were talking about, short term savings, housing, you know, better help with money for younger people rather than worrying about them engaging with their pensions. Um, I love the midlife MOT type idea. Mm. I don't know when midlife starts. I'm 56. It feels that's that's passed by now. Uh, but but I think almost you might almost have a rite of passage. A kind of at age 45, everyone gets their wealth and career checkup. You know? Would that be a government thing or government provided thing? Or? Well, or government nudged thing. So you right. know, it could. I, I'm more relaxed than some journalists I can think of at the industry having a part. I mean, mm. you know, um, provided that it's. It, I mean. In a sense, you can't stop providers talking to their members anyway. But so, so something that says in a world where we're all going to live to 100, as it were, think about the next 20 odd years. Are you still going to be doing the same job? Do you need to retrain? What does that look like? Yep. Uh, when do you want to start work? Have you put enough aside? If not, what do you need to do between now and then? You know, that in holistic conversation, wealth and job and health probably as well while we're at it. Um, that's perhaps, I think, the way I would do it. I'd all, I mean, it's absurd to suggest that you switch on overnight, but you could have progressively intensive nudges. I think we're very bad at things like birthdays. You know, I'd yeah. love to see every app pop up and the government tell you we've just added £50 to your pension for your birthday mm. or something. Yeah. You know, stuff like that that wouldn't really cost much money, mm. but would be disproportionately effective, mm. I think. Mm. You know. No, good shout, good shout. And um, so, so there is a balance there. Um, and there's there's a there's a timing aspect, but let's just focus on the sort of the default, the inertia, the auto enrolment. And you know, you spoke earlier about the making automatic enrolment work with you and changes that you thought were necessary to to make sure auto enrolment was a success. Um, where do we go from here? You know, we've obviously had the 2017 review. Yeah. Um, but you know, what, what what is the sort of end state or the the next end state for for auto enrolment in your opinion? I think there's a couple of things. So, well, three things probably. So, first is implement the review we've already had. I mean, it's, you know, good people, careful analysis, auto enrolling from 18. Actually, even employers are kind of like, to be honest, we don't really want to have to draw lines at 22. Mm. That's a bit messy for us. So mm. that seems sensible. Gradually getting the six thousand ish down to zero is not trivial because no. it gives you a big jump at thresholds mm. but I think on balance it's probably the right thing to do so let's do that first I think the second thing is I'm not in general in favor of increasing the mandatory contribution rate for employees just yet but I would do it gradually for employers because I think five plus three five from the worker three from the firm is indefensible mm. you know what system in the world expects the worker to put more in than the firm mm. so I think incrementally getting the three up to five would be seen to be fair, could be done gradually, actually probably reduces opt-outs. Mm. You know, you're throwing away 5%, not 3%. So, so a way of getting to 10 on the whole of earnings would be a big step. And then the third thing is auto-escalation. Mm. So, so, you know, it, it works, we know. When you get a pay rise, unless you opt out, your actual contribution rate goes from my 10 to 10 and a half, 11, whatever we think the end state needs to be. And that way people come into work at five plus five. We're not asking 22 year olds to put 14% of their pay into a pension, which I didn't, yeah. you know. So it gives that young worker a start, gets people up relatively painlessly to a realistic level in a relatively short period of time. I think, so, you know, let's not legislate for a statement season, let's legislate for auto escalation. No, that's, um, yeah, and, and again, using sort of behavioral science yeah. and um, it, interventions that have been proven to work as well. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, when it comes to statement season, then we could, we could have a whole discussion about that but 
you know, if you're going to sort of in, not interfere with autumn, but if you're going to build on it, making sure that you've done the testing, the analysis, the thought experiments to, to be sure what you're going to do is having the intended consequence rather than the unintended consequences yeah. has got to be a key key priority. Right? You, you mess with the Turner consensus at your peril in a way, don't you? Um, you, did a, you did a lot as minister, and, and we talked about this, to reform the state pension. Um, and you know you've been um, you've been continuing to work on the state pension by um, sort of running a number of campaigns on on, on issues and stuff. Um, so similar question to the last one. What would you like to see next in terms of reform of the state pension to to build on the introduction of the new state pension? Was it twenty fifteen? Wasn't it twenty sixteen? Twenty sixteen. Yeah. So so I think I mean I would in passing clear up the mess of the old system. So for example. I've helped to highlight, along with this is money, you know, 130,000 mostly women who've been underpaid a billion quid, and that needs fixing. But actually, that has unearthed a whole bunch of people who could get a higher state pension, but they do need to pick up a telephone and claim it. So mm -hmm. if you were, for example, a migrant, you come to the country late in life, you've got zero state pension. When you turn 80, you can have a state pension, a category D state pension, but you have to claim it. Mm. If you don't claim it, you don't get it. So I came across a hundred year old lady in a care home on zero state pension because she'd come to the country later in her life. She assumed she had no entitlement. She could have claimed it just after 80 in her case, and at 100 years old had no state pension. So she's missed out on 20 missed years. Missed out on 20 years of money. So, so over 80s who need to claim, married women whose husbands turn 65 before a certain date need to claim, divorced women who divorce post-retirement need to claim. Mm. So there's all these people out there, and DWP knows who a lot of them are. It knows who um, the um, pre-2008 women are. You know, there's, there's a group they know who they are. They could give me a list if I asked them. And they not telling them, mm. and I, so so I'd fix the old system. <laughs> yeah. Point one. In terms of the new system, I mean, it's ever so tempting to just kind of leave the blooming thing alone mm. for a bit. I mean, you know, probably that wouldn't be my first priority. In time, I think there's probably a case for streamlining because at the moment, underlying what is largely a flat rate system is an awful lot of legacy complexity. Yeah. You can get over the flat rate. You can get under the flat rate. Yeah. Uh, and I think there might be a case for just streamlining the whole thing and saying, look, if you did 35 years, we're just going to pay you the flat rate. Mm. And you couldn't do that in 2016 because it would have cost a lot of money. Yeah. But you probably could in 2030 or something. Yeah. So there might be a further stage of simplification. It wouldn't be my first priority. Mm. And just as just an insider's, you will be aware of this, but the reason we keep getting pension schemes acts and not pensions acts is the second they do a pensions act, someone will do a WASPI amendment. Yeah. So, so the government is not about to do state pension reform, I can predict quite confidently. Um, we, talk, we talked a bit about state pension age as well, and obviously that's um, inextricably linked with the, you know, the state pension system and stuff. Um, and you know, there will, as longevity increases, there's going to be continual calls for the state pension age to, to sort of increase. Um, what, what, what are your views on sort of a more flexible system about when you can take your state pension age? So you might sort of set, for example, a core state pension at 70. Yeah. But if you, you know, if you were sort of, um, if you needed the money slightly earlier, or you had ill health, or you thought you were going to have ill health and you wanted to claim it earlier, then you could have an actuarially reduced yeah. sort of reduction. Do you think we'll ever see that flexibility? I think flexibility through the state retirement pension is a terrible idea for reasons I'll explain, but I don't think therefore you do nothing. I mm. think you do something through sickness benefits or something like that. Right, so, okay, yeah. so just on those two things. So we already have flexibility upwards, as you know. Yep. So there is an age at BOO which you can't claim a pension, but you don't have to claim it at that age. You can have an actuarially fair mm. increase if you claim it later. And there will always have to be a, an age at which you can first claim. The worry about claiming early is, okay, so say the pension's round numbers, I'm going to say 100, obviously it isn't, but 100 for the sake of argument. And you claim it, I don't know, two years early, so you get 90. Well, what if we think you need 100 to live on? Mm which is sort of, you know, the state pension and the means test are roughly the same number. Mm. So you claim it two years early at 90, and maybe you can live on 90 because you've got a part-time job. What about when you're 79 years old and you're still on 90 and the part-time job's gone and you ring the government up and say, I can't live on 90, I need mm. 100. And they say, sorry, actuaries calculated 10 years ago mm. that you could have 90 for longer and that's what you chose, go away. Mm. So. What happens then? And yeah. who's going to advise the people who take it early and have to live with the consequences? And do they renounce the entitlement to future means-tested benefits thereafter? Yeah, or, yeah. or can they have means-tested benefits, but only 
deeming them to get full pension and then the difference. It just gets really, really complicated. Yeah. And of course, it's often the case that it's not the, 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 the vulnerable and marginal who use these systems. It's people like me. I probably quite suit me to have my pension a bit reduced and a bit sooner. I could take early retirement, combine it with other pensions. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm. Well, that's kind of not the point, really. No. So I, if we're going to add complexity, what I would do is there is a huge step between working age and pension age benefits. So mm. I'll tell you one killer fact is a couple on universal credit get less than a single person on pension credit. Yeah. You know, massive, massive step for being over pension ages against under. And if you've got people who genuinely, legitimately can't be expected to do any work, not just the job they used to do, mm. but any work, then could you have some sort of semi-retirement, semi-ill health type top up to mm. universal credit or something like that, that would be a stepping stone, would be fairer for people. I think that's the area I, you know, maybe for five years up to pension age, something like that. Cool. Um, no, good. Uh, yeah, and no, I think um, the sort of the integration between the working age system and the, um, the pensioner system is absolutely crucial in some of this, because you're right, there is a, a total cliff edge of, of yeah. uh, quite often, isn't there? Um, we're running out of time. We've got. We, we're going to have to sort of wrap up quite soon. But there's two things that we haven't touched on yet that I desperately want to touch on. One is um, defined ambition, and you really push this as a as a pensions minister. And you know, I for one was really supportive. There has to be a middle way yeah. of something. Um, and obviously, we've got a CDC scheme that's on the cusp of launching the Royal Mail scheme. Um, do, do you think more of these things will develop? over time? Do you think this is going to be the start of a progression around this stuff? Or do you think that the current proposals, to put it bluntly, are just getting the Royal Mail out of a bit of a, um, a small p political hole? I, I'm reasonably optimistic and I'm delighted it's happened as quickly as it mm. has. Um, I, you know, We talk to schemes who are thinking about CDC as an option. Um, I think it was always going to be for, for accumulation people coming out of DB in the first instance, yep. you know, it makes sense. Uh, people who've been scarred by DB and run for the hills of DC are not rushing to share risk anytime soon kind of thing, I get that. So I think there will be other people who come out of DB uh, who, if the Royal Mail succeed, they've done a lot of the hard work, which mm. is great, you know, so in a sense you can free ride to some extent on all of that work. I guess everyone will design their own variant, but, but that's good. I do think decumulation will be an area where we see more, you know, so the, the nice thing about the Royal Mail thing for me is although it's DC, if I'm a postie, I will get my postie's pension for as long as I live mm. and without having to buy an annuity. Yeah. And, you know, so I kind, I kind of think it, we will see innovation in that space and that's a good thing. It's, I don't suppose it will be mass market necessarily, but I think it will be far more than the Royal Mail. Mm. No, uh, that's, good. that's good to know because, you know, there is, a, there is so much space for innovation between pure DC and sort of the DB of the past. And and I, I quite often get frustrated with the CDC debate because people sort of almost suggest that CDC is one thing. Yeah. And actually there's a whole spectrum of different options yeah. and the potential for innovation out there. Um, that's That leads us quite nicely and, and your comments around that retirement into the whole freedom and choice and the pensions agenda, um, the at retirement agenda and stuff. And um, you gave us some insight earlier about the fact that you know, it's one of the things that the Treasury actually spoke to you about. Um, <laughs> I hope you didn't. So, well, I'm, I'm sure the Treasury officials didn't speak to DWP officials, and um, you, you may or may not have been allowed to. I was locked in rooms to, and yeah, not allowed no, to talk could, to anybody. I, I, could, I could imagine. Um, looking back on that, what was, what was your assessment of how this has gone so far? Um, and what do you think needs to be done to build on these reforms? I, I'm really bullish, to be honest. In uh, not with, whilst recognising stuff needs to be fixed, mm. I think it's gone better than I might have expected. So the, the notorious uh, Italian sports car hasn't happened. You know, mm. People aren't blowing the lot on riotous living. The big risk is the opposite, I think. You know, they cash out 100% of a modest pension pot because they want to get their hands on 25% for something, yeah. don't know what to do with the rest and bung it in a cash ISA. You know, all of that is a bother, yeah. but you can fix that. Yeah. It's, it's not the same as they lock into a poor value annuity till the day they die which you can't fix. Well, people often forget that the previous system was broken. Well, indeed, yes, yeah. yes. It's kind of like, yeah, but <laughs> that wasn't working very well either. Kind of thing. Um, but the other thing that really excites me, sadly, is it's made DC attractive. Mm. You know, how long has DC been the kind of ugly duckling, you know, uh, oh, if only I could have a proper pension, I've got to have this new thing sort of thing. Whereas in fact, D you know, DC done well, obviously, with flexibility is really, and so the, you know, the surge of DB transfers mm. tells you 
that there's something else people value as well as security and certainty and so on, which is flexibility. Mm. So I think make rebranding, revaluing DC is, is an unexpected win for me. Mm. Um, unfinished business or well, DB transfers still still not quite there on regulation. Um, low earners cashing out pensions and messing up their benefits. Mm. I don't think that was thought through. Mm. We've just produced a calculator site. People can go on, put their situation in, what benefit they're on, what they're thinking of doing and what it will do to their benefit. I think there's more we need to do for members there. Um, and then the other thing, post-retirement, I'm just working on a paper called, is there a right time to buy an annuity? Mm. Because maybe at 58, it isn't the right time. But what about 85? Mm. You know, what about the early adopters of pension freedoms 20 years on when their cognitive ability on average will have declined, their ability to manage their finances will have declined on average. And yet, are we still expecting them to make investment choices? You know, and we, you kind of know, but the uncertainty of how long you will live increases proportionately as you get older. Mm. So although, you know, so the way I would put it is if at 60, you can expect to live 26 years on average, you ain't gonna live 52. Mm. You know, you're not gonna live 212. Mm. So you're never gonna live double the expected. But if at 80, you're gonna live to, I don't know, 88, it's plausible you might live to 96. Yeah. So if you're managing a pot of money, which might have to last twice as long as you thought, the certainty of annuity starts to look more attractive. Yeah. So, you know, thinking through that, at retirement, bit of annuitization, question mark. Later in retirement, reviews, more annuitization. I think that's a fertile area. Yeah, that's um, that's good. And one of the things that we've been working on at Smart is um, our Smart Retire product, which is um, which is, is, is sort of using mental accounting to sort of put money into buckets. Oh. And there's you know, short term, you know, easy access, fix the boiler type saving. Then you get sort of more of a flexible income. But the, the whole sort of methodology is that there is a point where you want that secured, you want that guaranteed income. Yeah. So, you know, I think um, we will see more innovation in that space as, as this progresses, um, which is good. So thank you very much for answering um, a lot of our questions, Steve. Um, you've been a great sport and I'm going to ask you to ask, ask you to answer a few more, if You're that's great. okay. Um, <laughs> because we don't let um, any of our guests go without um, giving some sort of top tips and hints uh, based on your sort of experience. Um, you know, as a as an academic, as a politician, and as now as someone who actively is, um, you know, with, in the private sector pension system. So, um, first one: What was the one lesson that you feel helped you the most throughout your career? It was probably something that my private sector in the department said to me very early on, which is make the main thing the main thing. Mm. There are a thousand things you could do in government, and he said identify what you really want to do, prioritise it, focus on it, give it the time it needs. Yep. And I think that's why I was able to deliver stuff because there was that sense of people in the department really knew what I really cared about. Attention was focused on that. We didn't let ourselves get distracted and we delivered. So yep. so trying to trying to work out what you really want to achieve and prioritising that, I think. Yep. So, you know, in a way, the, the, it's... You can only have one number one priority. Yeah. It's, an, it's an obvious point, but yeah. um, it's a it's 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 a point that often gets sort of forgotten about. Actually, um, knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your younger self <laughs> or guidance if we're being picky? I think, <laughs> I think, you know. When I was 21 in my final year at university, I went through the careers guide from A to Z, and I couldn't find a job I wanted to do. Mm. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I did an economics degree in part, and I didn't know what an economist actually did when they sat at a desk on a Monday morning. What do you economize, mm. kind of thing. So I think for younger people, for my younger self, not being too discouraged by not having your life mapped out. Mm. I mean, for goodness sake, you know, I couldn't have guessed what was gonna to happen to me, sort of thing. Uh, and I think just, just kind of making careful choices as you go, not feeling the need, you know, and in a world of technology and all the rest of it, you know, our lives are going to be unrecognisable. Nobody saw COVID, all that. Yeah. So I just think recognising how uncertain the future is and, and not being discouraged by that, simply trying to, to you know, make the right choices step by step. If you could create a rule that everyone in the world had to follow, <laughs> what would it be? Well, having been exposed as a politician to uh, a certain amount of vitriol and bile, I, it would just be be kind, mm. you know, it would be that you can disagree with people and, I, you know, I, I break my own rule from time to time uh, on social media. But, you know, just that sense of, you know, 
the business of that you have to walk in somebody else's shoes before you understand them and yeah. so on so you know it's a bit twee i suppose but it's kind of it wouldn't half make things better as part of these um this series you're not the first person to say that actually okay. um so you know um i think um i think it was margaret snowden said you know showing showing compassion mm. um you know so there is a there is a theme emerging here um what advice would you give someone starting out in their pensions career um i do think learning across the piece is important. So so it's a funny one. I'm kind of having my cake and eating it here. So I think clearly specialism is really important. Mm. You know, you get to know a bit a bit in great detail. Mm. But but exposing yourself to to diversity in all its forms within pensions and beyond pensions, you know. So don't just read pension stuff. Yeah. My colleague uh, Dan Mikulskis from LCP is always on Twitter. He's always read this, you know. You see his standard Sunday tweet. He's his little boy sitting on his lap, and he's got the Economist in front of him, kind of thing. But you know, being intellectually curious, you know, not just the UK. You know, guess what? Other people have got the same issues. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I think I think that sense of yes, be a specialist and really do your stuff and do it well. But be open to 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 the breadth. You know, I, I've loved working in a DC environment at Royal London. I love working more of a DB world at LCP. Yeah. I've loved seeing policy. I've loved public and private sector. You know, the person in the street and the government minister. You know, so diversity I think is fantastic and stimulating and keeps it fresh. Excellent. And finally, um, it's all been a it's been a tough twelve months or eighteen months, isn't it? Um, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned yourself during the past twelve or so months? It, the, the big thing that I've worked on in the last 18 months is, is helping 130,000 women get their billion pounds of underpaid state mm. pension. And in the course of that, I've talked to a, a lot of them, not millions, but, you know, I've, t I've had phone conversations and email exchanges. And you just realise how utterly bewildering the system is for most real people. And mm. it's not their fault, it's our fault. You know, why should, you know, you ask yourself the question, how did 130,000 people get to be paid the wrong pension and not know? Mm. Because they had no idea what the right number was. Mm. And so we design systems and we, we forget that people not only don't understand them and that we haven't communicated them, but frankly, we shouldn't be designing systems that they need to understand. Mm. People have got better things to do with their lives than pensions. So there's a real sort of simplicity aspect to that as well. Yeah. Um, and I suppose with pensions, um, quite a lot of the time, just building on that is you wouldn't necessarily start from here. No. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we're not going to solve everything today. So, Steve, thank you for being a good sport Pleasure. and answering those questions. And um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, hopefully we've covered everything that you were expecting or you wanted to cover. But I'm going to give you the chance now as a former minister. Is there any topic that we, we haven't covered that you think you, you've got a desperate burning desire to to have your say on? But being a politician, I made sure that whatever the question you asked, I gave the answer I wanted to give. So I, I, think, I, I, I think we've covered it. I, I did notice that a couple of times, but no, no, absolutely brilliant. So thank you for taking the time for talking to us today. It's much appreciated. And thank you for tuning in and for watching the latest edition of this Smart Pension Connect webinar series. We do these monthly, so please keep an eye out on social media for the next one. And you can catch up on previous webinars on the Smart Pension website. Thanks again for tuning in and thanks again for Steve for joining us. Goodbye for now.